1911, was adopted on March 29th, 1911 by the U.S. military. What a sweet gun. Thank you, John Moses Browning. And that's the way they were trained back in 1911. You stand like that and shoot with one hand. Yep. They say Moses uh, divided the Red Sea. John Browning divided time. John Moses Browning divided time between before 1911 and after 1911. When it comes to serious combat pistols anyway. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. This is a replica, but this is what it looked like back in the day, 1911. Flat mainspring housing, all the characteristics. The very first of these babies when uh, it was adopted by the United States military in 1911. My gosh, people were driving Model T's at the time. State of the art, right? The Titanic had just been built. 1911, just to put that into perspective. Whew. They were riding horses, you know? A lot of the people being trained to shoot this and holster it were learning to do that while managing their horses, right? And for several years to come. And this gun is still viable today. It is carried by some of our, uh, even some of our military people. It's not the official adopted gun any longer, but it's actually carried by some more elite groups and uh, as well as uh, law enforcement uh, personnel and untold numbers of civilians with carry permits so uh, and people without carry permits how many places how many homes is this gun oh i don't know if it'd be lying on the dresser but it's somewhere hopefully in a lock box or a quick access box for home defense even so we're going to look at the 1911 we hope we do uh john moses browning proud but we're going to just be relaxed and enjoy the day and enjoy his uh, creation okay so come and join us and uh, let's look at some of his inventions here various formats okay let's go ahead and let that close up so you can get a good look at it but we pulled out a few different uh, 1911s that uh, basically we own and thought we'd just uh, celebrate the day uh, the, the, the March 29th date uh, we're gonna celebrate all year of course and have been. In fact, I've been celebrating John Browning for 20 or 30 years, I guess, at least. But we're going to look at some of the variations of uh, his fine creation and shoot some of them, talk about them, give you a little history, not too much history. But uh, we'll shoot and we'll chat, uh, jabber a little bit about it. And uh, if you don't know much about it, uh, maybe you'll know a little bit more than you, than you did. And it's quite possible you know more about it than I do. If you're a, a serious student of history, I know enough to be dangerous. The thing I know mainly is I enjoy the 1911. I like the 1911. I might wear a Glock hat, but uh, I really like the 1911 and have shot it, uh, uh, who knows how many, probably hundreds of thousands of times, uh, various uh, you know, different guns that I've owned. So you see what we've got out here. We've got a few things. Uh, it's a little chilly, but my ears back on. Uh, ah, feels better. We have uh, some uh, accessories, some original uh, military boxes of 45 ball ammo, the 230 grain round that was what uh, was issued, pretty much uh, standard all the way through its uh, adoption cycle through around 1985 or 86. Those you see are, are lead, they're not full metal jacket, but that's the essentially the only difference. Most of us that shoot very much of this, we uh, load lead 230 grain uh, bullets, and those are my hand loads. And I have a few over there that are full metal jackets that we might shoot a few of too. And that's the round that well, I grabbed a couple of those. That's the, the round that, uh, of course, the military adopted, full metal jacket 230 grains, okay? That way you know leading. You a little copper build up after a few thousand maybe, but uh, no lead build up at all. And, uh, work a little bit better perhaps you know especially the military configuration but we can load these for a little bit less so those are some uh we have and we have some several magazines loaded 
again with the lead 230 grain rounds hardball all right so we brought out some some things like that we've got a replica here basically the original one of the original uh, manuals for the 1911 February 14th 1914 look at that baby looks familiar doesn't it United States property so that was a manual on assembly disassembly and everything cleaning it you notice it is a big time I picked up uh, this special edition of the American handgunner the other day and noticed that uh, on the newsstand got a picture of John Browning so you've been hearing a lot about this for I guess a uh, few months now in fact that's pretty much the same gun right there this is the replica 1918 and uh, that is one of the centennial models at Colt is manufacturing essentially the same gun there so the one I shot this one as I said this uh, this gun is the configuration that we started out with pretty much you know your flat mainspring housing here you know the World War II model has that the uh, the fat mainspring housing and then uh, you have hardly any beaver tail there they added a little beaver tail this is the A1 that uh, came about in around 24 1924 they increased the length of the beaver tail a little bit because uh, soldiers and shooters were getting a little bit of hammer bite there I, I get it myself with this gun if I don't hold my thumb just right I get it's not the uh, slide that gets you at all it's not slide bite it's hammer bite and that hammer comes back you can see you know if you got a little bit of skin up in there you know it's gonna pinch you a little bit okay so uh, that little little bit of uh, addition there pretty much takes care of that they flatten the mainspring housing they uh, shorten the trigger it, it supposedly helped the shooting characteristics I think it forced soldiers to not shoot high as much I believe I don't know how much of that was there it also provided a shorter reach with a shorter trigger some soldiers sh with shorter uh, fingers smaller hands were able to manipulate this one a little bit better and this is just exactly the opposite with me I much prefer the long trigger and the flat mainspring housing and uh, that's and actually most people who shoot this gun a great deal uh, you know share that sentiment they uh, that's one of the first things that a lot of people do make sure it's got the flat mainspring housing and, and the long long trigger I, that's what I always did when I was competing with it um, much more you notice every single gun here except for the World War II model <laughs> has a flat mainspring housing and every one of them has a long trigger don't they huh imagine that so look at that errant case okay so so that's what we have here just to, let me give you a quick overview of the lineup here and we'll shoot some of these and talk about some things but this is the the original basically configuration here we have the a1 this was the you've seen this before the world war ii model came out in the 40s during world war ii this is the one that uh, I knew a little bit of the history on. It was actually carried in the Pacific Theater by a minesweeper. And, and this is a, uh, this was the one I've done a video on that, the, the Springfield, that it's an A1. However, I did replace the mainspring housing and the trigger on this one. Uh, other than that, this gun is pretty much stock, but it came with uh, the short trigger and the main. It was it's basically meant to be a replica, pretty much, pretty close replica of, of the uh, A1 like this one and that that's one that I, uh, I won in a Nipsic match the first gun I ever won I was really proud of that and uh, that, that's a good shooter and then we have the series 80s 1991 model where they kind of went back and and offered Colt did these guns with the flat mainspring housing and long trigger which is great because you've got some of the advantages and uh, you got the advantages of the, the better sights a little bit better sights something you can actually see you notice in these other guns whenever I pick those up they don't have much of a rear sight on them or a front sight and yet you've got the advantages of the long trigger flat mainspring housing so the series 80 model 1991 is just a really nice package just very very nice and then moving on up to the uh, the newer guns this is the the one gun I I have that's what we used to call souped up it's got the high ride beaver tail and, and all that on it has a long trigger of course uh, it's got pretty nice sights uh, in, in some ways just it, it does have an ambidextrous uh, uh, safety which I really don't like and I'm, one of these days I'm going to change that but uh, it's uh, 
consider in some ways the ultimate in terms of a practical souped up gun. It's the Ed Brown. You've seen that before. So I, I missed having a gun with that high rise beaver tail just because when I competed, that's what I had. I thought I'd just like to have one of those again, even though I admire the, the classic guns more, more in a lot of ways anymore. But that's, that one is uh, state of the art pretty much in a smaller package, commander size package. And that, that's again, a testament to this gun that there are gunsmiths spending the money and the time to create something like that, uh, a work of art really in a lot of ways in a gun that was designed, you know, back at the, almost the turn of the century, basically. And he really did, he started work on it before 1900. Uh, and then, now this is uh, a newer one, this is even newer than that. This is uh, the range officer offered by Springfield Armory. That, that just came this week, that's a, uh, a TNE gun, test and evaluation gun, that we've, uh, we've not tested and evaluated yet. <laughs> I, I think we shot two magazines through it yesterday. And uh, it's, it's meant to come from the factory ready to go if you wanted to compete in IDPA or IPSC uh, as a competition gun with just enough to, to make it really comfortable and ready to go. You know, the kinds of things you'd want to add as a baseline, you know, like the beaver tail, you got a nice trigger, it's got adjustable sights and a uh, match grade barrel. Uh, it's got a good feel to it. It uh, doesn't have checkering, but that's what it was designed for. It was designed uh, you know, if they'd done a lot of other things like, like front strap checkering and uh, you know, whatever else, night size, then before you know it, you're back up into the $2,000 category. So this gun is, uh, is a T&E gun from Springfoot Armory. They're, it's called the Range Officer, and uh, we may take a couple shots with it, too. It has the adjustable sights on it, kind of like the, the old Bomars we used to uh, put on the low ride or low profile Bomars, I think we called them. I believe they're out of business now. But anyway, so that's kind of what we have here, and I've had several other 1911s that have gotten away one way or another, but uh, we thought we'd get out all of our 1911s, and of course the stainless one there is John's, he's uh, lent that one to the project, so we're going to take a few shots, let's see what else before I do that, we've got the old uh, military holster you've seen before, I thought I'd show you a couple of, oh this is old Safari Land, uh, suede line holster. I've had that for well over 20 years, about uh, 25 years I guess it's coming up on now. Uh, that one uh, is, is pretty nice. I used that in the first uh, match I ever shot in. That's all I had. I think I may have told that story somewhere in a video or somewhere that I went down to a match and didn't realize you had to snap it closed if you had a snap on your holster. One of the rules, if you have a snap you have to use it. So uh, that's a neat old holster. And uh, of the military holster. This is some stuff I used back in the, wow, late 80s, 1990. Uh, this is a Ernie Hill rigs, what this was. <laughs> Ernie Hill belt. This is a state of the art. I bet you uh, the god of uh, IPSC shooting, Rob Latham, used this very same rig at one point. I don't know. But that was Ernie Hill speed leather. And I don't know if he's still making this stuff or not, but boy, that thing's been around. I have worn that in so many matches and non-matches. Stuff was really expensive. You know anything about leather and how expensive it can be, you can just tell by looking at that stuff. Really expensive, isn't it? So, just a little background there on the on 1911s as relates to my experience. So, let me pull one out here and shoot. So, shoot the same one or maybe a different one. You know what? In honor of John Browning, we have to shoot the World War II model, don't we? Take a couple shots with it. Oh yes, no way around it. <laughs> All right, uh, that, with that one, the magazine doesn't always uh, lock it back. We'll shoot one more mag. Let's go way out there again, just for fun. Or for the first time. Look at that, look at that, dead center almost. And that thing is a World War II model. <laughs> I'm just gonna let that be the only shot I take with that gun at the gong. Right now, it looks like it's right in about the middle. You know, 
that, that again is a testament to John Moses Browning. That, that gun after all those years will do that. It's amazing. It's amazing. And it's probably what a lot of people would consider loose. Yeah, it rattles. Yeah, it rattles. You know, it's old. Doesn't even have a match grade barrel. What do you want to bet? So we may take a few more shots with it before we quit. Okay. So World War One replica, original 1911, and then uh, World War Two actual gun, used World War Two, and then this Springfield made in about 1989-1990. So uh, we're going to take a couple shots with it too. Okay, in a minute. But what I wanted to do. Uh, is I told you I had some guns that got away. We want to have a few moments where we just kind of reflect on those guns that got away from me. It's really hard to think about some of those beautiful works of art I let get away. I know y'all probably had the same uh, misfortune, uh, especially in 1911. It's just, uh, I'm sorry, John Browning. It's just uh, so sad because they're such beautiful guns, well-made, so functional, uh, historical. In many cases, they're just unbelievable, aren't they? Well, now one I did not let get away, and that is the uh, Springfield that uh, I've had since 1990. It's the gun I've had the longest in terms of a 1911, and I will not let it get away. I promise, John, I will not let it get away. This one I'll hang on to, and uh, pretty good shooter. As I said, I've changed out the mainspring and uh, the trigger. Other than that, it's stock. So let's just take a few shots with it and continue our celebration. All right, see if it still shoots. Uh, I haven't fired it for a while. It's good though. Okay, I have several magazines here, so let's just play a little bit. We need to get rid of those evil sodas so they're, they're not uh, cut by shrapnel accidentally. <laughs> that was interesting. Interesting. Ah, <laughs> oh, sweet, sweet, sweet. Well, this gun really is sweet. But we just had some uh, issues with it. We had a mag, looks like the mag uh, catch is worn on this gun. So we'll deal with that at another point. And we happen to have some other choices to shoot. So we'll fix that and get him back in working order. Okay. Good old Springfield there that I uh, have had so long. So I'll look at that uh, on my own time, not on your time. How's that? Why don't we go to John's gun and get it really nice and dirty for him. Make him clean it. <laughs> You know, by the way, I don't think I pointed out that this holster is uh, an old gun sight holster I've had for, I guess, over 20 years. Used to use it in some competition. I was, uh, I played with the open class for a little while, but then I just uh, did nothing but stock gun stuff. And this was about the slickest, uh, the closest thing to a speed holster I ever used. In fact, I, most of the time I used it inside the waistband, but uh, I did use that some. It's pretty handy for a 1911. And uh, I've got some on the old gear, too, a little historical uh, look. This is an old Bianchi uh, mag pouch that I bought about 20, 25 years ago. This is just a newer version of the same thing. So, boy, that thing has seen some use. And then this is the mag pouch that, that comes with the, uh, the range officer from Springfield. So, have kind of a mixture there. When you're shooting or competing with 1911s, especially if it's IPSC, you do need a lot of mag pouches. You need a lot of shooting. You may... I don't know, I haven't done it a long time, but you shoot uh, 15, 20, 30, 40 rounds in one stage, you know, so you uh, you need plenty of ammunition. Okay, let's try this Series 80, uh, 1991 model. Again, you know, you have long trigger, all the stuff I like, a little bit better sights. So let's try the gong with it. Let's make John Browning reach out.
<laughs> All right, I like that. Let's try that again. Nothing like throwing big chunks of lead to 80 yards and then hearing it hit. I love it. John Browning would be proud. It's funny, you don't hear a ring when you miss, do you? <laughs> All right, that is fun. I love the sound of gong in the morning. All right, let's just throw some lead here close. Play with this thing. Nice. I don't want to leave all my mags on the range here. I want to load some more. Possible. <laughs> sweet, sweet, sweet. Big old chunks of lead flying around. <laughs> well, they rock the place, don't they? Woo! Two hundred thirty grains will do it. John Browning knew that. All right, sweet, sweet, sweet. I think I'll keep it. Make John keep it. That's a nice gun, I have to say. It's a good trigger too. Nineteen ninety one Series eighty. Sweet, sweet, sweet. What have I got here in the way, Mag? We have lots of mags. We're in good shape. You know, one thing we hadn't talked about, I noticed on that gun, the sights are, uh, are pretty nice. And uh, one thing we had not talked at all about, just to show you the progression of sights on these guns. It was one of the complaints, I think, on the early ones. You notice with the, uh, uh, the first one there, the left one, uh, neither one has a lot of sight to it, of course. But you have a kind of a tight groove on that rear sight. That's the uh, original 1911. And then on the A1 on the right, you're looking at the, uh, they opened up the, uh, the groove in the rear sight a little bit more. You can see a little bit of difference there. So you had a little bit more to, to look at. <laughs> Not a lot of front sight on either one, but uh, a little bit of an improvement, a little bit. So, you know, they're, uh, they are what they are and uh, very sweet. And this uh, Springfield, uh, the newer Springfield, that was made in 1989 or 1990, has a similar sight. That's the A1 sight, basically. They did a good job of uh, replicating the A1 sight on that gun, didn't it? It's pretty much uh, what the original gun looked like. And then when you get to the 1990s, uh, the uh, 1991 Series 80, you have some sights you can actually pick up pretty quickly, can't you? Three dot and uh, very distinct. Uh, groove in that rear sight and of course with your your white dots not a problem and of course they're dovetailed you can put any sight on there you want night sights like on the Ed Brown you can uh, you know these are of course uh, custom sights you can uh, put just anything on a 1911 you want to everything under the Sun all kinds of night sights uh, big dot sights uh, just, just you name it. Look through the catalogs. Go to Brown Hills or somewhere, and there's pages and pages of sights for any gun, not just the 1911. And then, of course, you can even do this. You know, like the uh, the range officer from Springfield. You can you can put a really serious rear sight on there if you want to. Uh, you can leave the front sight black, as that one is. I actually like a white dot or some paint on the front sight. Uh, I really do. Uh, but. Uh, it's good to have a black sight there. That way, if I miss, I can use that for an alibi cannon. Let's just shoot this thing. We shot it a couple times. Definitely not broken in. But uh, so again, uh, let's get some magazines. Uh, as I say, whenever I get all this stuff out, I don't, I don't rely on a 1911. Let me put it that way uh, to defend myself. <laughs> so. I don't put a lot of time in on making sure all my magazine springs have been replaced. I, I pick up a new uh, Wilson magazine. It seems like about, I don't know, I've got two or three of those uh, in case I ever do get the, uh, you know, the, the rare uh, 
I don't know, motivation to, to carry a 1911, which I do occasionally with that Cobra carry, and, and even the Series 80, it's, it's kind of rare. But uh, I just, when I do that, I rely on either the Ed Brown magazine that came with that gun, or one of the uh, Bill Wilson you know, magazines, which are generally considered to be one of the very, very best made, and there's some others, but uh, these, are, these are good ones. Uh, so, we have some, some pretty good magazines here, but then we have a lot of these have 20 year old springs in them, tell you the truth. So, guns in my holster, forgot where it was. Let's just put one of these in to start with. Let's see what we have. Yeah. So, again, we're using uh, uh, home loads here with uh, a variety of magazines and all that, but uh, we just want to shoot some. All right. Feels pretty good. Feels pretty good. Feels good. Let's go pig hunting. Okay, I think I know where to hold. Nice thing about sights like that are you can you can uh, adjust them to wherever you like to hold and then just leave them there. All right. Yeah. That's a nice sight picture, I have to say. I can really see what I'm shooting at there. Also, it's a nice trigger. Makes it tough, because you know I don't have a lot to blame it on if I miss. Other than just holding too low. <laughs> All right, let's just clean them off. What John Browning would want, I think. I don't know if we'll get into a chicken shoot or not today, because I don't want to take three hours here on animals, but... I hope got the wrong one. Well, trying to sneak a bullet over that plate... I'm seeing a lot of black. <laughs> My black sights, black plate, black turkey there. They're all kind of blending on me. <sighs> but you know what you have to do when you're missing? Calm down. Relax. Get a nice sight picture. And popping. There you go. Works most of the time. Sweet gun. Of course, it's a 1911, right? <laughs> I like that. I like that gun. It is pretty good. You know what? We, oh, we've got a guy here we got to shoot, too. Uh, so we're going to do some of that. I don't think there's anything here that, uh, that I'm overlooking we were going to do. We mainly just wanted to get out all the 1911s, have a little extravaganza of 1911 action. Uh, give you a little history and some of my own personal history with the gun. There'll be a lot, a lot of information throughout the year on the 1911, no doubt about it. And uh, you, you might get tired of hearing about the 1911, hopefully not, because it is a sweet gun. Fun to shoot, a lot of fun to shoot. It's hard to beat that trigger. 
you get one really tuned just right it's uh it's just a quite a piece of machinery no doubt about it and as i've said before i think it's really special to uh to be using something still today that was designed so long ago and in the exact same configuration even I enjoy shooting this uh, this replica, and I had one that was an original. It was what 1913, I think it was made, 14, uh, by uh, Colt, and then one by Springfield, both. And I used to shoot them. You know, I mean, this, yeah, you could have carried it. Could have been your self-defense gun. You know, so just something that's that old that is still that uh, that usable and functional, still still works for uh, its intended purpose. So, let's take a few more shots with this one. Since the ones we have are all dirty, let's just really get them dirty, dirtier. You know. All right. All right. Fun, fun, fun. <laughs> yeah, teach him to mess with me. Caught him by surprise, didn't I? He didn't think I was going to come after him. Wow. Big old 45 slow, took care of those guys. Oh, uh, wonder where you're holding the gong with this one. Let's hold right on the bottom of the gong. I think that'll be about right. That's what I get for thinking. That's why I try not to do it too often. Of course, I might have flinched. Been known to happen. Yeah, I'll bring him up a little bit. <laughs> I see him rocking. Those rounds make him rock. Okay. I guess we've had almost enough fun. Let's, uh, you know, I have some old 10 round magazines. These are really old and the springs are kind of uh, worn. So I'm gonna, t I'm gonna hammer the cinder blocks here with them and whatever else I need to here. We're gonna chew them up. If these magazines work, I'll be <laughs> Look what John sneaks some two liters inside his blocks. <laughs> oh, too much fun, too much fun. So anyway, a little look at the 1911. Don't want to overdo it. Uh, they're just a lot of fun. And you've seen a few here that, that I enjoy uh, every now and then have enjoyed a lot and uh, if you don't have a 1911 what's wrong with you good year to buy one as I've said before it's a great year to buy one so uh, I guess with that we'll leave you John Browning and all, all I can say is thank you John Browning you done good life is good <laughs>